We're about to pick up with part three of Mike's walk and talk of Little Round Top. In part three, we're going over to the position of the 20th Maine, furiously assaulted by the 15th Alabama on July 2nd, 1863. A debate as we will about the importance of the 20th Maine, there's no disputing this. They were the end of the line. They were ordered to stay at all hazards, hold in place, or die. When we left off with Mike, he was discussing how crucial time was on Little Round Top, how mere moments decided the contest. Let's go ahead and continue with Mike. And those crucial minutes were in the favor of the Union on that day. So that's it. So let's talk about Joshua Lawrence, James. Let's talk about old Lawrence. We're going to go ahead over there? The 20th Maine. Yep, let's go talk about those. All ones. right. Come on, Finney. <laughs> Yeah, that's the other thing that's interesting too. I mean, look at this. Weed, the, the brigade commander for O'Rourke, is mortally wounded. Hazlitt, the artillery battery commander, is killed. Vincent is mortally wounded. O'Rourke is killed. James Wright, who commands the 44th New York, who takes over for Vincent, he's killed later on in the Overland Campaign in 1864. Ooh, sorry, Ooh, there, the commander of the 16th Michigan, Norvell Welch, is killed at Peebles Farm in 1864. But who was the guy that survived? Joshua Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. yeah. History is not written by the victors. History is written by those who write. And survive. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's talk about the 20th Maine here for a moment. Yay. Yay. Everyone's favorite uh, Jeff Daniels character. <laughs> anyway, uh, 20th Maine is placed on the left of Vincent's line. And 20th Maine is the least experienced of all of his commands, including the least experienced regimental commander for sure. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain had only assumed command of the regiment just prior to the Gettysburg campaign. And he had become a, basically a full colonel then as well. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's not in actually physical peak either. He's been suffering from heat exhaustion, if not heat stroke. He's been bedridden a couple of weeks at a time, having his brother there with him. Not Tom, but John there taking care of him um, and so looking over him. And so he's, he's had an interesting couple of weeks getting promoted, having coming down with the heat, uh, looking kind of peaky. <laughs> Anyway, sorry. I'm going to keep doing movie quotes. But uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, again, is the least experienced of Vincent's colonel level or lieutenant colonel level commanders. So Vincent, before he goes over and settles the rest of his line, is actually going to come over here with uh, Lawrence Chamberlain and actually help to place his regiment, which is initially facing this direction. The right flank marker you see is right there. It's connecting, would be connecting with the 83rd Pennsylvania. Take away, before we go anywhere, take away this stone wall. The stone wall is not here. Again, these are part of the breastworks that were built July 2nd to July 3rd by the soldiers who are up here. Also take away from your mind the tour roads. Obviously they weren't here either. And the signs and things like that. So what they're doing is they're basically facing this direction, connecting with the rest of Vincent's line. Vincent is going to tell Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, actually order him to hold up here at all hazards. What does that mean? What does that mean is that in the Civil War, if you shot off your ammunition or you felt overly threatened, sometimes you had the latitude to fall back and expect relief. What Vincent is telling Chamberlain is, you can expect no relief. You are here. You are to hold this at all costs, to the last, all hazards. You are to be here. You are not to go anywhere. You're to be right here. So Vincent is being a good leader. He is being clear with Chamberlain about his expectations for Chamberlain. Chamberlain's going to do what he should do. He's going to establish his line, but he's also going to send out a company of skirmishers, Company B, 
to go cover a little bit of his left flank to make sure nothing's coming in from that direction. All right, so he's going to send them out over there. That's the last he's going to hear from them for a while. So they're going to go and they practically disappear. All right, so he has his men facing this direction. While Vincent's men are getting absolutely attacked on every other point of the line, this side is still relatively quiet until Confederates come off of Big Round Top. First, the 47th Alabama comes down, and they're going to get hit with a withering fire from the right of the 20th Maine and the left of the 83rd Pennsylvania. Their commander's going to be critically wounded, and it's a small regiment, so that's pretty much it for the 47th Alabama. They're more or less done after that. So he's here. He's hearing the battle going on over there. Having repulsed this right here, and someone draws his attention to Confederate soldiers moving around the flank or trying to move around the flank to get around. Chamberlain is the left of the Union line at this point. He's the left of the army. That part is true. And he, he if he moves from this position, much like the 16th Michigan on the other side, it threatens this position, all of Vincent's position. So what he does is something unconventional. It's a textbook maneuver, but it's really risky. Usually in Civil War battles, what you would want to do is you'd have your line in two ranks deep. One line forward, one line behind, right? This is in order to maintain in case of casualties, but also to maintain a massed form of fire in front of you. What Chamberlain's going to do is he's going to rest his right flank here, basically where their flank marker is. He's going to place the flag of the color guard near where their monument is. He's going to take that back rank, the second rank, second line, and refuse the line. What he means by refusing the line is bending it back at an angle. This is to ensure that you can maintain fire in that direction if the, if the enemy soldiers or Confederate soldiers are coming this way, right? So refusing the flank is not an unusual maneuver. Plenty of regiments do it here at Gettysburg, but he's doing it here in a risky way because he's thinning out his line very dangerously. <laughs> All right, so he's bent himself back, trying to cover this. Over here, he'll place the flag and the color company. Having the colors that day would be Sergeant Andrew Tozier. The 20th Maine, just prior to the Battle of Gettysburg, will receive an influx of 100-plus men from the 2nd Maine Regiment, which had been mustered out because the two-year term of service had expired. Now, it wasn't in some grand speech that was given and those men's patriotic hearts were awoken by the eloquent Chamberlain to come and fight in their ranks. No, they were fed into the regiment throughout the month of June, getting incorporated into the rest of the regiment. And among those, because the regular color bearer was actually sick, was Andrew Tozier. Andrew Tozier will accept the responsibility of being the color bearer. And he's placed his flag right there. So this is a story of flags here on Little Round Top. One flag going back, one flag being the hinge point of the line. The Confederates, sure enough, are going to attack. This time the 15th Alabama. And Tozier is there, but one of his color company, a corporal, gets wounded. And he asked, Sergeant, can I hold the flag? I don't want to go, but can I hold the flag? So Tozier gives him the flag, takes his weapon, starts loading and firing. Eventually that guy goes, oh, I'm, I'm just too wounded. I've got to go back to the aid station. Okay. So Tozier takes the flag back. But in the meantime, he is still loading 
and firing. So he's holding the flag and he's loading and firing at the same time. This does not happen. Color bearers don't do this. And both Chamberlain, the colonel, and Ellis Spear, the captain who's in charge over here on the left flank, look over and they see this. For his action and his bravery at Gettysburg, Andrew Tozier is going to receive the Medal of Honor. Now after the war, the wounds he sustains in combat during the war are going to really impact his life. And he's going to fall into a life of crime. What? Oh yeah, he's going to become a criminal after the war. Andrew Tozier. He's eventually pardoned and he is actually accepted because of his high profile status with the 20th Maine into the household of the 20th, uh, of the governor of Maine to help his rehabilitation process to get back into society. That governor of Maine? Joshua Chamberlain. Joshua Chamberlain. Uh-huh. But Chodger would go on to, to rehabilitate himself. He would no longer have crime after that, be a part, be a criminal after that, and there you go. What, uh, what do you know about the what Oates' brother on that rock? Ah, Are yes. you can we, can we go talk about let's talk about uh, him. Go, let's go talk about the rock. Talk about him. Come on, Finney. Let's talk about this. Chamberlain what the Chamberlain spots is absolutely correct. The 15th Alabama is trying to get around the flank of the 20th Maine. Alright? They're trying to do that. But they're stymied by Chamberlain refusing his flank. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to stop. <laughs> they're going to try coming up here and fighting. Let's talk about the 15th Alabama for a moment. The 15th Alabama started their day in New Guilford, Pennsylvania. That's 20 plus miles to the west. They march here, march into position to attack, and then attack. Okay? Imagine that. It's almost like running a marathon or walking a marathon, and guess what you get to do? You get to lead an attack up this. Yeah, no. I, no, Mm-mm. no, no, no. Without water. But, uh, that's I'm going to get Okay, to all right. It's a hot day, and they've been without water for hours. So while they're waiting before the attack starts, William Oates, the commander of this regiment, is going to send off... 30 plus guys with the canteens of the regiment to go find water. Now think about this for a moment. He's sending 30 plus guys to go find water. He's taking 30 plus guys away from his attack force. But he's also taking these soldiers who've never been to Pennsylvania before to go find water. Just pick a direction and go. Go. go, go, Maybe over there. The regiment attacks before they can return. What's worse is that these 30-plus guys get captured by U.S. sharpshooters. <laughs> Whoops. So there you go. Oates also detects that there, he gets up to Big Round Top and they actually stop. He says he can turn that into a Gibraltar when a staff officer from his brigade commander arrives. I can turn this into a Gibraltar. <laughs> and the, basically the aide says, I'm paraphrasing, well, that's great, but you're supposed to attack yeah. go go attack and so he gets his men going and they start coming down this way they're going to he's going to actually dispatch company A to go and take care of some wagon trains maybe there might be some water over there too but he's not going to he's, they're not going to be available for him either so he's also detached a company to go find a rumor of wagon trains and that doesn't pan out So he's attacking with less than his full force. They're thirsty, they're tired, but then they attack. And repeated attack, attack after attack. Let's go over here and let's try to look up this ridge, okay? But they're having to attack over this. Over and over and over again. 20th Maine is being stubborn. The left flank is being stubborn. And the battle is ebbing back and forth. Attack and counterattack over and over again. It's a desperate situation. Finally, Oates is going to order an attack. It's going to come up here and they're going to pierce the line, according to Oates. 
push it back. To just about here. But if you notice, the flank marker for the 20th main, well, the right flank is almost there. The 20th main's almost bent back on itself, like a bobby pin. It's, this is a desperate situation for a 20th main. Among the lead in that attack is going to be the brother of William Oates, named John Oates, not of Holland Oates. Uh, and he's going to, there's a history between them. William Oates, prior to the war, uh, beat a man so badly, he had to go on the run. And he kind of fell into a life of being a drifter a little bit. Eventually, his brother comes and finds him and says, come back home. In a way, William Oates lost himself. And John Oates came and found him and brought him back home. John Oates is going to be among those leading this attack this, up this way. They're late in the attack. And he's going to be mortally wounded right near this rock, according to William Oates. Hmm. Now, William Oates will advocate for placing a marker or a monument dedicated to his brother. It's an order that he will regret for the rest of his life, ordering this last attack here. Because it costs his brother his life. And he's going to be advocating for a monument here for his brother. The person that blocks it, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. No. Chamberlain claims they never got this far. Oh? Yeah. He claims they never got here in this area. So he refuses to even entertain the idea of placing a monument here. So who's the hero of Little Round Top? <laughs> well... There's one more stop I'd like to go to, if oh, you don't mind. I don't. Yeah. Uh, not the end of the story, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that towards the end. But let's go to our next stop, if he can handle it. I've got a little path, little path down there, and we're going to see this from the 15th Alabama's perspective. Would we'll love that. Okay. Let's, let's head. So let's go talk about them. And, and I think oftentimes we talk about the 20th Maine in, in respect to that, but we also have to understand the 15th Alabama to do what they did to make the attack after the attack that they did, and to come so close to breaking the 20th Maine. Because I do believe William Oates in this. I'm not there with Joshua Chamberlain, but everyone's up to their own interpretation. But to do that under the conditions they were operating under was truly remarkable. And so, yeah. So you have to kind of more or less look at it as two different stories. And for both of these regiments, this was the fight. This was the war. This could mean the difference between victory and defeat. The stakes were high, at least in their mind. And we'll go to our next stop. All right. All right. So what I want to do is show you the position and perspective of the 15th Alabama as they're attacking. It's this right here in front of you. Right up there, if you can see it, is the left flank marker for the 20th Main. Over here is the 20th Main Monument, okay? And so what, it's basically, almost looks like a rock wall right there in front of you. And this is what you have to move up in order to attack that line, over and over again. In the last attack, when John Oates was mortally wounded, that's pretty much the last of it for the 15th Alabama. They're done. They're going to be coming down here and reforming a little bit. But then something unexpected happens. Bayonets! Mm -hmm. Here comes the 20th Maine. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain had been ordered to hold at all hazards. But this intense fighting had expended the ammunition of his regiment. They had pulled the ammunition from the dead and wounded as well and shot that off. So now... Now they're empty, but the orders still stand. He hasn't received, as far as we know, any other orders, especially from Vincent, who is now mortally wounded at this point. So he is still under the condition of holding at all hazards. Moreover, he writes, 
that he detected fire coming from his rear, meaning that Confederates might have gotten up over the hill or on the right side of Vincent's line. Still under orders and still desperate, he orders them to fix his regiment to fix bayonets. Now what happens next is up for dispute. Ellis Spear will have one version of the story. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain will have another version of the story. But what we do know is that the 20th Maine charges down with bayonets fixed. And no, they didn't swing like a door. Okay? They're just coming down this way. You're Alabamans. You've been up this little ridge here multiple times. You're thirsty. You're tired. And you're like, nope, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Oates is going to claim that he gave the order to fall back. I don't know. I just know that if I'm in their position, I'm completely exhausted. I'm thirsty. I'm probably cranky. I'm done. And I see these crazy blue clad dudes coming down at me with bayonets. I'm out of here. See ya. We're done. We're not doing anything here. But let alone that Company B that straight up disappeared at that moment decided, hey, it's a good time to enter the fight. So they pop up from a stone wall over there and open fire. That only precipitates the 15th Alabama getting out of here as quickly as they possibly can. Oates himself will be so exhausted, he's going to faint on his way up Round Top again. And two of his soldiers are going to have to carry him off. Hmm. So yeah, that's the perspective of the 15th Alabama. So could you imagine? You've been through all this, and all of a sudden that unexpected thing happens, and here comes Chamberlain and his men down the hill. And then Oates becomes governor. Yeah, that's the other thing. Chamberlain becomes governor of Maine. Oates becomes governor of Alabama very late in the 1890s. <laughs> uh, Chamberlain's governor of Maine in the 1870s. Uh, but so it's, it's an interesting thing that both of these men will live long enough to write about this over and over again. And that's the thing I want to impart here, is that history, the quote it goes, is written by the victors. In this case, history is written by those who write. We know the story of this battle, and then the Battle of Little Round Top, a lot due to Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain living a long time after the war and writing about it and talking about it. William Oates writing about it and talking about it. But also, men like Oliver Wilcox Norton, who was the brigade standard bearer for Vincent's brigade, he will write a really good history of this battle called The Attack and Defense of Little Round Top, in which he incorporates the experiences of other people who were here, including his own. Again, history is written by those who write. Imagine those voices who were taken on this hill who could have added a different layer. Not only the common soldier who fell here, the rank and file soldier, but men like Strong Vincent, who's mortally wounded. Men like Patrick O'Rourke, who's killed. Men like Hazlitt or Weed, who do not survive this fight. What about Rice, the commander of the 44th New York, who takes command of Vincent's brigade after Vincent falls? He's killed in 1864. Those voices are gone. We don't know their story. So the interesting thing about this, as much as we can talk about the story of Little Round Top, as much as we know about it, it's an equal measure of what we don't know because of the voices that we lost. But men fought and died here. That's important. In recent years, there's been an effort to discredit Chamberlain or to discredit the fight on Little Round Top. To say it wasn't, well, I wouldn't say discredit, more like downplay. Let me rephrase that. It wasn't that important. People will point out that while Chamberlain's doing what he's doing here, what's going on in Cemetery Ridge is going on at the same time. So this fight in Little Round Top has been mostly over by this point, and they're just firing the dying embers of this particular battle. Moreover, this was only between one regiment and one regiment. If that regiment had captured this hill, what were they going to do? 
And more to the point, there's also a whole division of the Sixth Corps hanging out back here on the eastern side of Little Round Top. Even if they had captured the hill, this is a counterfactual, you still had a whole division back there that could have sprung into the attack. So for all these reasons, Joshua Lawrence, Lawrence Chamberlain is not that important. The 20th Maine, not that important. Before the novel, before the movie, they weren't that important. So, they're not that important. But these things that we talk about are things we know, not things they knew. For Chamberlain and for Oates, this was the fight of the war. For these men who didn't know all these other details, this was the difference between victory and defeat. And both sides here fought desperately. To downplay Chamberlain and to badmouth Chamberlain, you can if you want. You can criticize him for his account. That's absolutely fine. But to downplay him and his men's effort, I think is a discredit to the men themselves who fought here so desperately and so well. Yes, there are other stories here at Gettysburg. Trust me. There are a bunch of great stories here of heroism, bravery, and all that other things that you can attach to in a story as vast as Gettysburg is. But we shouldn't throw one story under the bus because people feel it has an overplayed role in the story. That right there, that's my soapbox moment. So 20th Maine and the 15th Alabama. You asked me, who's the hero of Little Round Top? Well, the hero of Little Round Top, I could point you to individual commanders. But I think, as with the Gettysburg as a whole, it's kind of an answer I give for the whole thing, is the common soldier, the regular soldier, the, the rank-and-file soldier of the Army of the Potomac. On many a battlefield, part of the battlefield, especially here, they stand tall. They do their job and they, they do their heroic actions. These are men that we might know their names, but they didn't leave writings behind the war, and, and they didn't go on touring events, and they didn't become governor of Maine or anything like that. These are men who simply did their duty in a very difficult situation. And for me, the hero of Little Round Top cannot be assigned to one particular man, but to the group of men who held Little Round Top against an attack that they basically were hit with. So that for me is interesting. For me, and I'll make one last note, is Little Round Top would not, it, it becomes a battle because it's the left flank of the Union line. This was not a target for Lee's attack. But because it's the left flank of the Union line, that makes the fight here important. So there you go. That's the Battle of Little Round Top. Amen. That was a brilliant tour, Mike. Thank <laughs> you as always. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. And thank you for watching Mike Luntz's part three of Little Round Top Walk and Talk. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, follow us on Instagram, and have a great day.